I think it's also maybe because I live in San Francisco and we're all tree huggers here. Have you ever really hugged a tree before? <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> I bet I have at certain point. You've changed. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to Diary TV. I'm Daniel Lee and today we'll be talking about personal finance and ESG. I've been in San Francisco for a little over a decade now, 12, 13 years, and I've, I've been in the wealth management space during that time. I help my clients with investment management, but as well as just general financial planning topics. So that could cover tax or estate planning or insurance and whatnot. I'm with a firm called Plan Corp, and we manage about four, four and a half billion dollars. And then I also consult for a fintech startup called Bright Plan. The idea there is that I'm limited to maybe 50 to 100 clients that I can, families that I can work with. But through Bright Plan, we have tens of thousands of users on the platform. And so I could have a much bigger impact on their lives in terms of, at least in terms of their personal finance. I also teach at UC Berkeley Extension and in, in their personal financial planning department. This will be my fourth year and I'm kind of like a big money nerd. Like my whole like, <laughs> my life revolves Yay. around all these personal finance topics and I love it. So are most of your clients family offices? You mentioned families or are they kind of high net worth individuals or even institutional investors? I'd love to get an idea about the mix of clients that you have. Yeah, they're primarily high net worth individuals. I would say net worth on average is between five to $15 million and their income is usually a 1 million plus. It makes me happy that there's so many of them in Silicon Valley, but it also makes me sad because there's so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of makes you wonder what you're doing with your life. When did you first start to get interested in finance? Did, did that happen while you were at university at U of M? Uh, or perhaps you were in another field and then you transitioned over into personal finance? I didn't even know this field existed, to be honest, when I was an undergrad. But after undergrad, I went to work for a company and I just didn't really enjoy what I was doing there. And so I felt like I wanted to do something more finance related because that's something that I've always been interested in. And so I started kind of exploring what type of finance that I could do. And initially I was going to go into investment banking, the kind of the typical the route or kind of the accounting route. Mm -hmm. Then I wanted to do something where I interact with people more so than just a, a spreadsheet. So I decided to take some classes at Berkeley because they were offering a personal finance curriculum. Again, I think I just kind of got lucky in that I ended up getting a job and then I found out, hey, this is actually something I, I really enjoy. Okay, so you kind of fell into it after finding out that you're interested in finance and interacting with people. I also noticed that you have both the CFA and, and CFP certifications. Was that something that you did prior to entering the field or as you entered the field that you found that you needed that type of certification? Initially, I tried to apply for all these jobs in the wealth management field and it, it was very difficult to get my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. So I went to Berkeley to get my CFP to qualify to sit for the exam. While I was taking classes, I was able to network with a lot of the students there who happened to work for some, some good firms out here. So I actually got the job even before I got my CFP. I don't think they would have hired me if I didn't show them that I was committed to getting my CFP. And what about the CFA as well? Was that afterwards? Yeah, that was afterwards. I think I was a little bit naive and thinking that, oh, I got my CFP, what's next? Maybe I'll get my CFP. <laughs> and part of it was that I was so junior at the firm that I actually had some extra time. I was doing a lot of paperwork that wasn't like mentally challenging. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'll study for my CFA. And then like halfway through, work started getting more busy and I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> I can't <laughs> stop because I was already halfway in. And so I ended up thankfully finishing, finishing the CFA too. The CFA certification is actually really popular with those in investment banking. So I was there, you know, just briefly for about five years. But that was the one kind of certification because it covers so many aspects of finance, portfolio management, quantitative analysis. But also, and this is a great segue to the next part, I saw the curriculum within the CFA program and they're starting to blend a little bit more about impact as well as uh, environmental, social and governance issues. That might have been after your time <laughs> studying. <laughs> It but was, I, yeah. I'm, yeah, it was. Okay. <laughs> if we can move to, to ESG, so environmental social governance issues, when you started getting interested in ESG, 
whether that was more of a kind of personal endeavor or a kind of personal attachment or whether you had some clients who were really passionate about making impactful investments. So after my CFA, I was part of the investment committee and so I was helping them research some, some products for clients and investment options when I kind of fell into ESG. I think it's a passion of mine to be more environmentally friendly, to, to be more socially just. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if your portfolio could also align with your values? I would say even like five, six years ago, there weren't a whole lot of options. And so it's been nice to see kind of an explosion of the types of funds that are available, whether you're high net worth or, or just starting out. So there are a lot of different investment options available for, say, institutional investors when it comes to ESG. So you have your equities, you have your fixed income, and even alternative investments. What are some of the options that are available for, say, high net worth individuals, but even those who are just starting to get their feet wet in ESG? I think there's certainly more flexibility if you go more high net worth. One of the options that we have is like a menu, and you can almost kind of pick and choose the different types of values that matter to you. An example would be you don't want gun companies in your company, so you check that <laughs> off. You don't want for-profit prisons, so you check that off. And it could be very tailored to, <laughs> to your needs. I find that that's pretty rare, even amongst the higher net worth, because a general kind of ESG fund that's very low cost and very accessible kind of covers a lot of that. <laughs> um, in, in that sense, yeah, I think anybody really could align their portfolio to kind of what they want to see. I think investing long-term sustainably for those that use resources well in a way that is more beneficial to key stakeholders, I think those are the ones that are going to be generating long-term value. And so that really aligns with my belief in fundamentals and then performance following those fundamentals. But there are those who either don't care or that's not as much in the radar. And so for those clients, what do you think it might take for them to become more interested? Is there maybe a prevalence of thinking that it's, it's very warm fuzzy and it's not based on uh, actual performance. I'm just wondering what, what's kind of the mentality behind that. Yeah, I think the two challenges are that one, they typically have higher fees and those fees mm -hmm. have come down significantly, but you can invest in the S&P 500 fund for like 0.01%, which is basically free. Right. The lowest ESG funds I've found, I think are like 0.15%, which is still really low cost. But there is, if you're super fee sensitive, it is slightly higher cost. From a studying kind of research perspective, the, the historical record doesn't go as far back. You know, with an S&P 500, because you can look back 90 years with an ESG fund, it's a little bit harder. Right. Outside of that, I think the other challenges are that, I think you said it right, the, the warm and fuzzy kind of feel. And it's very difficult, especially when it comes to a social kind of screen. What make sense for that investor. One story I heard was that Coca-Cola was considered a sustainable fund because of all their recycling practices. So it was included mm -hmm. in one fund and then it was excluded in another fund because they said it's socially bad. It's a sugary drink and a lot of right. people have, have diabetes and whatnot as a result of drinking too much soda. In those ways, I think it's difficult to measure what's really going on in a, a social fund. But right. that being said, I think when it comes to companies that are grossly negligent with environmental practices or that have just really bad governance practices, that's a risk factor. That's not right. just ESG related, but that's a, that is a financial impact. For those that maybe don't care about ESG, I would challenge them to look at the performance side of it. These are the risk factors and, and you might want to exclude or underweight these companies because mm -hmm. something could happen. And an example of that is Volkswagen was excluded mm -hmm. from a lot of ESG funds right. because they had bad governance practices and the whole scandal came up. There's always two sides to the coin, but I think if you keep on kind of digging in, it's going to be very difficult to come to any conclusion. I think it helps just to be curious to kind of dig into what the funds own and, and what companies you're invested in. I guess also because it's a fuzzy area, that's why we have jobs uh, as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> we need those who can think critically and think on behalf of, of clients as well. And so I think that it's very needed and very, very glad that you're there for <laughs> San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll do what I can over here in Seoul as well. Maybe now we can switch our focus a little bit to young professionals and maybe even students who are interested in investing and interested in ESG. What are some practical steps or advice that you might give them as they're starting to get their feet wet in investments? I think it's great 
for young investors to to get their feet wet. First of all, my former boss always used to say, "There's no better time to make a mistake than when you're young." <laughs> I would feel free to try out different things if you're interested in picking individual stocks. I mean. Go for it, unless you're managing like your parents' money. You know, I would ex- try your hand at individual stocks, like researching different companies. But as your as your wealth starts to accumulate, my investment philosophy is always to stay broadly diversified, and mm-hmm. to keep costs low and keep taxes low. And that's mm-hmm. how, generally, how you're going to come out with a successful portfolio. You're advising a lot of high net worth individuals about their own portfolios, depending on their preferences and tastes and investment horizons, as well as their risk preferences. I'm curious about your own financial planning, <laughs> but just to get an idea of how you invest as an individual, you as Daniel Lee. So I'm a very aggressive investor, and I use our fintech app, the Bright Plan app, for most of it. So I would say 90% of my assets are in low cost index funds that are pretty much automated, probably. Maybe fifty percent U.S., fifty percent foreign. When you say asset, you mean liquid assets? Liquid assets, yeah. Okay. My retirement funds and my other savings accounts, and I would say that's pretty much automated. So I don't really look at it. I do have my side money where I just invest in a number of of individual companies just for fun. But even if that all went away, it wouldn't really impact my saving. I have a good amount of. Cash, which is kind of my emergency savings. I would say that's probably maybe almost six months of cash that I would need just in case something happens. As far as ESG goes, actually, it's not a hundred percent ESG because a lot of my money is in our retirement accounts at 401ks or 403bs, and they right. don't always have the best ESG option. And then I'm very excited to say that Bright Plan. We'll be coming out with an ESG portfolio, I believe in April. We're just tightening down the compliance part. I'll be switching over to ESG going forward once it's available. Very nice. I think there are also some students or even young professionals who are very interested in your field, in terms of uh, financial planning, personal finance, and also wealth advisory. So if you were talking to them and maybe giving them a little bit of advice in terms of how they could enter the field or prepare to enter the field, what are some things that they could do on a very practical level to try to enter? We see. A lot of our new hires kind of coming from a lot of different areas.、Mm-hmm. I would say if you're interested in it, it's it's definitely helpful to study some of the CFP material. This day and age, if you can blog about it, just show that you're very interested. That's always helpful. And then in terms of the the qualities that I think really matter in this field is one, you want to be quantitative. Enough to be able to explain, you know, what the portfolio is doing and what the markets are doing. A lot of it comes down to being personable and and really、mm-hmm. just caring about your clients.、Mm-hmm. If you can come across as somebody that's caring and that wants to do the right thing, I, I think that's that's a quality that that we all want in a in a candidate. I always say when I first meet a client, I'm going to ask you for a bunch of information. That sounds ridiculous because it's so personal, but I just need the information to be able to work with you. After a while, the clients that that trust you are just like, I don't know. Go ask Daniel; he'll give you an answer. <laughs> Whatever Daniel says is what we're gonna do. It's a great feeling once you build up that trust, but that that trust building kind of aspect is probably one of the more challenging parts of the industry. That's a great vote of confidence, and I think the biggest compliment they could get from a client, so that they can. It is, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So, if you are interviewing, say, a few candidates for the position, what's the one thing that you're looking for immediately? This is kind of a wishy-washy answer, but <laughs> I I do want to feel like that person cares and and will do the right thing. And I I don't know how you come across as that, but that that is. Probably the most important thing, and then in terms of knowledge or quantitative skills, I always feel like if you're willing to put in the work, like we can always teach that to you. Are you willing to learn? If you're put in a difficult position, are you going to be the type of person I can trust to do the right thing, even if it's admitting kind of your own mistake? Like we just have to know that you're somebody that's trustworthy. 
One of the benefits of SNS is I get to see some of your free time <laughs> outside of the office. I know that you do a lot of volunteer work, and I know that you probably wouldn't say that unless I prompted you <laughs> because you're so you're so humble like that. But I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about some of the activities that you're involved in and how maybe those who are interested in the same areas could get involved as well. Yeah, so I've been involved with an organization out in San Francisco called the Korean American Community Foundation. And it's a grant making organization where we help other nonprofits run their nonprofits better. And then mm. we also put on a couple of big fundraising events, and then we provide grants to those, those nonprofits. The associate board has a lot of different focuses, part of which is youth empowerment. So providing scholarships to kind of the underprivileged, I guess you could say, Korean Americans in the Bay Area going to, to colleges. But my primary focus was on the elderly. There's a senior center in San Francisco that I was actively involved with just just visiting every week just to see how the, the seniors are doing. It was fun just because they're all like in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And they just like having somebody young like hang out with them. And I oftentimes went there and just didn't really do anything, but they would feed me and I would eat. And I would <laughs> uh, They did make me sing once, but that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was the song? What was the... Uh... <laughs> they made me sing the national anthem. <laughs> But you know, it's, it's like a very cute community that, that I was actively involved with. When COVID hit, since I couldn't visit them anymore, I was actively involved with the program that delivered meals to them every day, from Monday through Friday. And it was really cool because we were able to fundraise for that and a lot of people gave. And we had a large donor that gave, I believe, $300,000 to get the, wow. the effort continue to go. And so it was Great. a really cool way to see the community come together to help the, the seniors. I helped deliver the meals too. And it was very nice to see some of the seniors that I hadn't seen in a few months. Oh, and that's another challenge I think with COVID-19 and social distancing, that oftentimes it takes a toll on those who need that social interaction the most. And so it's great to see that you're doing that. Were you involved in the cooking or <laughs> just the delivering? <laughs> So I was not involved in the cooking, and what, how that actually ran was we partnered, <laughs> up with some of the, we partnered up with some of the local Korean restaurants. Oh, great. And, and they gave the food pretty much at cost, but by using them, they were able to continue their, their restaurant operations without shutting down. So it was, oh. it was a nice way to help out multiple parts of the community. You come to Korea normally every year, right around December, Christmas time-ish. Fingers crossed, hopefully you'll be able to do that this year. So if you come, I'll of course buy you machine <laughs> mishi. So don't cut that out, William. I will not cut this out. This is my this is my oath. What is your wish list for what you would like to eat? So I have an idea. Let's say top three. Gosh, that's such a difficult one. So I, I really like kimbap and tteokbokki and all the the sundae. <laughs> I love it because it's so accessible, it's so good, it's so cheap. Whereas in San Francisco, a roll of kimpa would be like ten, fifteen dollars. No, no way. And they're not they're not as good either. <laughs> and so I always eat a lot of that. I feel like there's always something that's like in when I go, like something new that's always popular. So I kinda just go with whatever the trend is. Interesting. So it's going to be punshik and kind of uh, item. Uh, <laughs> so when you come, we'll have a follow-up episode that shows evidence that you have been fed properly. <laughs> Fantastic. That sounds right. awesome. Uh, Ten dollar kimbap, but that's that's kind of criminal. So thank you so much for joining me today. Best wishes for your wealth advisory, for your teaching, and also I hope to see you in Korea very soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. <laughs>